Hi, everyone, and welcome to my second floss tube. Again, welcome to my second floss tube. I am overwhelmed by all of the lovely comments, the views, the clicks, the likes, the subscribers to my first floss tube. Thank you. I am just overwhelmed. Um, it was such a joy to read your comments about your stitching journey. I just would sit and read them and reread them. And so many of them were so familiar to my own stitching journey. It, if you haven't read them, please do. It's just wonderful. If you haven't seen the first floss too, please watch and please comment because I look at those comments every day. I get an alert when someone comments. So I go right away and take a look at it. The photos at the beginning of each floss tube, last week I was so excited <laughs> about doing it, I forgot to mention, but the photos at the beginning are just photos last time and this time of our garden. Unfortunately now, uh, our little raised bed garden has been hit by several days of frost, so it isn't quite so pretty looking, but the sugar snap peas are actually doing really well and I've been gathering some vegetables from them. Actually, I don't even make to the house. They're so good to eat right in the garden when I'm working. The carrots are doing all right. The lettuce is doing well. Everything else is just not looking so good, but it's that time of year. Also, there's some pictures of just scenes around the house. And in this floss tube, I actually included a scene of some thread keeps and floss cards that I made this week. So that, that's what those pictures are from just around the house. The quilts behind me are from my Celtic Peace Delusion. And if some of you watch the first floss tube, you remember I said I'm a quilt teacher, an author, fabric designer. I've done all of those things for decades. And I'm re-coming back to cross stitch. So the quilts behind me are just from the Celtic Peace Delusion book. And I'll put the link to a YouTube video about that particular technique in the description. In both floss tubes and in all future floss tubes, I plan on in the description linking to the things that I talk about. So you don't have to try to remember, hmm, what was that one that she did and talked about? Sometimes I might forget and not catch everything. But if there's something you wonder about that I didn't mention, please put it in the comment and I'll add it into um, the description. Now, one of the things that I talked about last week was, let me go to close-up camera, is this is one of the works in progress that I have. I'll show that in a little bit, but the needle minder. And I love the needle minder. It's kind of a new notion to me since I've returned to cross stitch. I like the fact that I can throw the needle or park the needle on the back, or if I'm working on the front, I can also put it on the front. The this needle minder is from the Caffeinated Cat Etsy shop. And I sent her a little note and told her that I would be talking about her. And she graciously has offered a discount. So the discount, let me check the code. It's capital C, 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 10. And I'll put that in the description and also a link to her Etsy shop. So if you would like a needle minder, if you've never had one or would like a new one or some more, you can use that discount. I'm not sure how long it will last. Um, I would say a couple more weeks. So if you're thinking about it, go ahead and jump on that. And she's graciously giving us a 10% discount. Now, some of you actually had worked with the Nantucket School of Needlery which was fascinating to read. And several of you wanted to know a little bit more about the box top and what was covered. So let me go to that, move this a moment. And I thought what I would do is show you what was covered, there we go, under section one. 
So in section one, it covered the running stitches, whipped running stitches, threaded running stitches, Eskimo lace stitches, double running stitch, Hoblin work, which we would think of as black work, variations of double running stitch, interlaced band stitch, interlaced double running stitch, Yugoslav border stitch, Bosnia stitch, French fence, that's hard to say, French fence stitch, that's a tongue twister, triangle stitch, cloud filling wave stitch, open and closed composition of stripes, aspect within a color, aspect of color within a hue, and their influence on each other. So I'm going to have to go back and take a look at my notebook because do I remember all those years ago what we talked about? No, <laughs> but I'll go back and I may later on do some videos on some of these stitches because it's been a while since I've seen them, just kind of fascinated by them. All right, let me set this down and come back here. So one of the other, actually, I'm going to show you something else under the close-up camera. I've been looking at some of my books, and here is another one that this is not an old purchase. This is a newer purchase, but it's an older book. I bought this at a used bookstore in our town, and I love that they always give us a protective cover. I only paid uh, $9.99 for it, but what struck me as when I was in there looking at their books is all of the different topics that are covered, knitting, crochet, tatting, go back to the beginning here, um, white work, mending stitches. I think I saw a section, here's linen embroidery. Ah, it says information on linen embroidery. Tapestry, I think there's, oh, look at the Bargello, Florentine stitch. Knitting, I think there's even macrame in here. I mean, look at the, look at the illustrations. Tatting, macrame. Now, I'll tell you in a minute when this book was written. You can probably guess by the illustrations. Just all kinds of open work. Topics are covered in this, laces. So when I saw this, I thought, you know, first of all, it weighs about two pounds. So I knew that it would be just full of information. The title is The Complete Encyclopedia of Needlework by Therese Deldemont. Now, a little bit about Therese. She was born in Austria in 1846, and she died in 1890. And she, early on, worked for the company that we know of as DMC. And so she set about perfecting every form of sewing, crochet, knitting, tapestry, goldwork, macrame, and applique that she could. She specialized in all forms of embroidery on cotton and linen, including open work. And she accumulated examples of sewing and handwork, and as she reproduced them, she invented many stitches herself. She wrote this huge definitive book in 1866. And you can kind of see that by some of the illustrations. So just four years before she passed away. And it has been revived, revised, and edited routinely ever since. It's been translated into 17 languages, every stitch, Dictionary Encyclopedia owes a huge debt of gratitude to her because many of them hearken back to her work. So this is a little bit about it. And what's really fun is this is still in print. Now, this copy that I have is a second edition. It's from the Running Press in Philadelphia. So DMC has kept this going. This particular edition that I have was copyright 1978, but you can get a current issue now. So I will link to that. So if you are looking for something that is just full of information, 
I mean, just, I, I will just sit and pick it up and look at pages and then, you know, put a bookmark in where I'm at and, and go from there. So this is the complete encyclopedia of needlework. So look for the link on that. So here is, come back here to me. So here is something that I have been taping some product reviews, just things that I've found around the house or that I've purchased that I have really enjoyed using. And one of the videos, which we may just put that up right before we do this one, but it is, the reason I bring it up is because I want to kind of harkens back to the book. You'll see in a minute, it's like, well, that's cryptic. So the product that I'm talking about, I mean, a whole separate video, but I'll just show you real quick. It is a book. Well, it's a pattern minder. And it's what I used in knitting. And I remembered I had it. And I thought, well, this will be handy. And in the video, I'll talk all about that. But also in the video, I'm showing how just this attaches with a magnet and you can set it up so you can set it right next to your station or your stitching. It has magnets and I have this chart that I'm showing how to. This is what I like to do. I like to isolate what I'm working on really tightly. So no matter, let's say I'm just working on this, this A here, I can isolate what I'm working on. And you might be looking at this going, wait a minute, wait a minute, you shouldn't be showing charts, it's copyright. Well, that's what is fun about this particular hint or website. I'm gonna show you all of these or some things I printed out. And the website is, and we're gonna to go to that. It's right here. It is. Let me make sure I get it right. AntiquePatternLibrary.org. These are old books. They're in public domain. And they are the scans of many of the books. And they are all kinds of things. You can see here we've got lace and let me look what it says. Beading. But I'm going to click on cross stitch. And be ready for a rabbit hole. So don't do this when you don't have time to look at it. But let's just look at this particular one. This is from DMC. It's from 1890. Let's just click on this PDF. Some of these will be in French or different languages, but I'm looking at the pictures, so it's okay. But look at on this particular one, all of the beautiful alphabets from the late 1800s. So that's one of the pages I printed out. These are in public domain. So you are free to use them. You are not free to sell them. You can use them yourself. So as I said, just take a look at I mean, look at all the alphabets in this one booklet. I'm just going to go to the end here so you can see. Some of them will be just a few pages. Some will be many pages. Uh, let's go back and take a look at another one. Some of them will be more embroidery than cross stitch. The descriptions will be here. Some of them haven't been scanned yet, so you'll see that too. Um, let's see. Here's one that's more darned net, but suitable for cross stitch. Let's just take a look real quick at that. So some of them you look at and go, oh, okay, that's nice, but I'm not going to use it. But some of them are going to be things that you could use for cross stitch. I haven't looked at this one. There's some really interesting pictures. Some weird ones. <laughs> And some interesting ones. Okay. I don't know what that animal is. Just look, you're going to go to the end of it. So like I said, this is a rabbit hole. And I haven't found a good way to save the ones I like yet. 
Um, sometimes I'll print them out. I'm wondering if I just need to print out the page. Let me go back here. Print out the page with this and then make notes as I look at them. But there are all kinds. Look at these are all embroidery. I mean, rabbit hole. So it is, I'm not even to the end of it. I haven't looked at all these yet. I've just started, but it was such a good resource that I wanted to share it. It is, again, I'll put the URL in the description, but it is antiquepatternlibrary.org. And you can look up all kinds of handwork. These were all the ones from cross stitch. Wow. Hundreds, hundreds. I like this one. You can't, I can't get to yet. Some of them have been scanned. Some of them haven't. People will donate the books. Um, sometimes they donate them already scanned. Sometimes they just donate the books. I mean, I don't even know how many hours you would have just looking at this. But I found that resource just to be a really helpful and fun to look at website. And looking at um, the encyclopedia, let me go back to that. Going back to this encyclopedia just reminded me, because they are older illustrations, just reminded me of some of the illustrations I saw looking at all those different PDFs. So just some fun things to share with you. Let me take a look at my notes here. I know last time I said, I'm gonna show you my works in progress or my whips and I'm gonna show you something I finished and I never showed you the thing I finished until I was cleaning everything up. And I went, oh, okay, make a note, show it next time. So I'll show you the works in progress that I have. And then I'll show you the complete fact. I'm going to show you the completed, the finished option. Now, we talked last week about the language that's different. Me coming to cross stitch from decades ago, we didn't have some of these notions. We didn't have some of these uh, terms. So I'm learning all these things. But a finished object is your finished stitching. Finally finished means you've finished the stitching and you've put it into whatever form it's going to be, whether that's in a frame or as a pillow or, you know, different objects. So I will show you my finished. Let me go to my camera here. This is from Teresa Cogert's book, Broad Stripes and Bright Stars. And I think it's just a wonderful booklet. And I did this one, Old Glory. So here it is. It is finished being stitched. It is not finished. And I don't know if I'm going to do a little pillow or I did it on a large enough piece that I might do some other things here and then make them all into pillows. I haven't decided. And do I have what I used? No, I do not. I think that might be um, vintage country mocha. That looks like it. I'm going to see if I did not make a note of it. And we'll talk about that another time about making notes about your projects as you're working with them. Just looking here, I did use some DMC and some weeks. So I Followed the called for threads on that. I think this is 36. Count. Hold on. Let me grab a paper that I think I put that on. It is vintage country mocha. I was right on that. I was wrong on the count. It is 28 count. So that is my finished object, but it is not finely finished. 
let me show you the Quaker dwelling. I've been working on that for the last couple of weeks since the first floss tube. And here are the, I actually did a silk conversion. And this is Silk's NPI from Colorado Cross Stitcher. She did a silk conversion, so I did that. And I'm enjoying stitching with silk. I was a little nervous about it, but there was no need. It's great. So here it is. I've been working down on the house and I don't think I've done any more motifs. I've just been working on bricks and bricks and bricks and windows. And later in another floss tube, I'll talk about the scroll frame. But one of the things that I found very helpful is this magnetic cord. And it'd be very handy if you have cords around the house that you need to wind up in this magnet. But these are perfect if you are stitching on a frame, because if you don't have that there, this flops around. See how loose it is? So this gives it a little bit more stability and I can just move it up, grab it, and it holds it. So those are, they come in a lot of different sizes. I bought a package, I'll link to it. They came in different colors. And these are, I think, 6.8 inches. I don't think it says on here. Magnetic cord organizers, what they are, but they really work well for your frames. Or if you're working on a large piece and you want to gather up the fabric or the linen or whatever you're using, you can use that. So I'll put the link to that in the description. So I think last time, I think it was up in here. So I've got this much done. And I'm kind of saving the mortar to when I am working and I don't need to concentrate as much. So that's why I haven't done any more of the mortar. Let me show you another work in progress that, or another start that I did this week because I am going to do a video about hoops and frames. And I thought, well, I'm gonna try one of the frames or one of the hoops that I bought and I haven't used yet. So I am doing, many of you know this lovely sampler. This is Harriet Salt, 1866. And this is by Hands Across the Sea. I saw this and I think it was one of the addicts videos. And if you are new to cross stitch, you need to go searching on YouTube for attic needlework. In fact, I will link to that. Let me make a note of that. I will link to that because they just have wonderful videos. I'm just writing that down. So I'll put that in the description. But I purchased this chart and I saw in one of the videos just the top part done and I loved all the alphabets. And it's a big piece. So what do you do when you have a big piece? Well, I guess <laughs> what I do is I do it on the smallest count linen I can find, which is 56 count. And this is another video I'm going to be doing about the things I found that help me with these higher count linens. It's not hard. It's not hard. So this is my start on 56 count. This is weeks and linen 56 count and the color is parchment. And I am doing it with the main red swasserfine and it is color, I think it's 103. Nope, that's some, another project. Uh, this is 24.99. So that's the lighter one. Now, why do I have darker? Well, if you take a look at the sampler, it's 
all the same color, which I had originally intended to do. But then when I started stitching, I thought, you know what I'm going to do to make it my own is I haven't decided exactly which alphabets, but I'm starting with the top one and I'm going to put my initials in the top one. And then as I see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, oh, there's a bunch of alphabets. So what I need to decide is how often I will change to this darker color. Because so I thought one line of alphabets, I would do my initials. The next one, I would do my husband's. Another one, I would do each of our children. And I haven't decided yet where, because I want it to look thought, thought out, not just every other one or every one, and then I decide not to do anymore. So all I know right now is I'm doing the first one with mine, and then I'll decide which one next will have my husband's. So I am doing this darker color in 103 silk color 335. Now, why didn't I do it in Swasserfine? Well, that's because I didn't have any. So I did have a red of 103. So don't think they look too different, although I really like the Swasserfine on 56. And I think that the 103, I like it on here but I think I would like it on 46 count better. I haven't decided. So that's just one of those things. You probably don't notice the difference whatsoever. And I don't really either, except when I'm stitching very close up. And this one seems, it is a little thicker, but I don't think it's noticeable. So I'm just going to leave it. But this is the work so far on Harriet Salt by Hands Across the Sea. And this is another one of the caffeinated cats, needle minders. All right, let me put that up. So those are the two things I've been working on the this week, my well, last couple of weeks. This one just started a few days ago, and then I've been working on Quaker Dwelling by Kathy Barrett. So let me ask you, let me come back here. Let me ask you, here's a question that you can put in the comments. So my question to you is, what is your biggest challenge while you're stitching? And you can't say not enough time because none of us have enough time. Oh, we could just make a time machine, but none of us have enough time. So it can't be that. Or, or you can say that and then add something else. So what is your biggest challenge? I'm curious about that. My biggest challenge when I started cross-stitching again was working on the smaller count. Started with the Ada. Here's my, it's right here. Uh, started with a smaller count Ada. I showed this last week, the um, uh, stitch along that I'm doing. And I started with reading glasses, wasn't cutting it. And then I knew I wanted to go up to 40 count linen what do I do? So I made a little video of one of the products that I have found that's been a lifesaver. So let me add that in and take a look. I wanted to give you a review of a product I have found that's extremely helpful. When I started doing cross stitch again, I would use my reading glasses, or I should say, try to use my reading glasses. I'd put it on and here's um, one of the, I showed this in my first floss too, one of the stitch alongs that I'm doing. And it's on Ada, I think it's 18 count. And I was using my reading glasses, but I was really having to strain to see it. And I thought, oh, that's gonna, my eyes are gonna get tired very quickly. So that's not going to work. And what about when I start using linen? Because I love the look of it, but I was a little nervous because I thought, well, how am I going to use a higher count? How am I going to see it? So I have a lamp that goes over top of my, um, where I sit and stitch in the living room. And I thought, well, I've got the lamp. I'll get one of those magnifier discs that attaches to the lamp arm, and then it can go right over top of my work. Well, I did order one, 
it just, it wouldn't reach very well. I could never get it in the right position. And then I was like straining to try to get it underneath my work. And I thought this, this isn't going to work. I need something hands-free that's going to just be there. So I tried a magnifier. You've probably seen it. It's on a chain. It rests right here. Disaster. So that didn't work either. So I want to show you what I found that works extremely well. And I have used it for months and months now. Love it. It is the Mag Eyes. Get where you can see it here. It's the Mag Eyes hands-free magnifier. It comes in a package like this. And you may have seen it or you may not have and wondered about it. But the one that I purchased came with the lens number two and number four. So here's the original size. This is what it looks like magnified with the number two lens and the number four lens. And the lenses come just like this packaged. So then you can, sorry for the noise, you can open them up and I'll show you how they slide right in there. So that's the number two lens of the number four lens. And when I first started changing out the lenses, I thought, oh no, I have to be really careful. So I don't mix them up. I need to get them in the right package. But then I discovered, let me find it. Let me zoom up, look at here, right there. See how it says four? So you can see which one it is. So what I have in here right now is the number seven because I am doing a very high count. But the way you take it out, it's very easy. It just flips out and then you can just slide the other one in with it. You can see it. Just like that, just clips in. And then if that isn't powerful enough or it's too powerful, you can just switch. And I'm gonna go back to the number seven because that's the one, well, let me show you. The two that I ordered in addition to the ones that came with it, I ordered the number five and the number seven lens. And what that does, as you can see, the number seven magnifies it two, almost three times. So that is the one that I've been using on the higher count linen. And the package you can see, there we go. So number seven, and then here's the number five. And they all have that number on there so you can see what it is. Now I am working right now, and I'm gonna do a video later on about things I found helpful for very high count linen. But this is what I'm working on right now. This is a 56 count. And I'm going to be talking later in another video about hoops and needles and all kinds of things I found helpful for higher count. But you can see it's on the table. And you can't see the linen very well. Now, if I zoom in on the close up camera, yeah, you can see it. But you know, you're not going to have a close-up camera with you. So I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to put the lens up to the camera. There we go. So see how magnified it is when you have it there. Now I'm going to flip back to me so that you can see how you use it now kind of looks goofy, but I don't care. I can see through it and I can see without any eye strain. So there's a soft section right here. You're gonna put that against your forehead and I have bangs. So I kind of put it right against my skin with my bangs over it. Now this moves up and down because maybe, I know this looks silly, <laughs> but it works. Now, very seldom do I stitch like this. Usually I am sitting back in my chair and I have it a little bit more down like this so I can adjust it. So I can stitch at a level that, I'm gonna take this off now. 
I can stitch wherever it's comfortable because sometimes we do. And I see people stitching very closely because they can't see. Well, that puts a strain on your neck, on your shoulders, on your back. So if I get in a good position with pillows and I'm all set up, I can move that mag eyes to exactly where I see it. Maybe if I put it down a little farther and move it. If I need to see very close, when I bring it closer, this magnifies a little bit more, which I just discovered that. So I can put it very close if I need to see something very close up. So this has been the best find for me. And I've had this now maybe four years. Started out with the first two lenses because I wasn't working on such a high count linen. So I started out with the number two and the number four lens. Then when I decided to go to, well, the 36 count or the 56 count, I knew I needed the highest power. And I think I use the number five lens for about 40 count, but everyone's eyes are a little bit different. You can see, you know, which works best for you. Now, sometimes, and it usually depends on how the light is, or if I've been stitching a while, sometimes I will put my readers on and then put the mag eyes on if I'm in a spot that I really need to see well, or I'm feeling like my eyes are getting a little bit strained. But that again, will depend on your eyes. But I did want to share that with you. Let me put the picture back up so you can see what it looks like. And I will put a link in the description for the mag eyes um, that come with the two and the four, and then the additional five and seven so that uh, you can take a look at those. But this is great for cross stitching or stitching in general. But if you are a jeweler, if you are doing models, uh, fly fishermen, anglers, it just all kinds of things this works really well for. Me. And this is very lightweight, so it doesn't bother me to wear it for a very long time. So I hope that you enjoyed this little review of Mag Eyes. So I hope you enjoyed that little video about the Mag Eyes. I love them. I can do all the way up to the 56 count without a problem. So that's one of the things that was a challenge that that's how I solved it. So I'm curious, I guess this is another question you can answer. If you have trouble seeing and who doesn't, uh, the higher count linen, what's your solution? Uh, Cause we all have different situations, how we stitch, where we stitch. So what have you found that's helpful? My product that I found was the mag eyes. I love them. So I use them every time I stitch. So I mentioned I had done some other videos. I think I'm going to go ahead and put that in right here. So I have two fun finds. That's another tongue twister. Two fun finds. I think it's two that I want to share with you. And these I did not purchase. I already had them at the house. And it's how I use it for cross stitch. So let's put that video right here. I wanted to give you another product review. And this is something actually I bought when I started knitting uh, again, which was over 10 years ago. And it's something that I remembered I had that I used when I was reading knitting charts. And I thought this is perfect or a cross stitch chart. So let me show you, you might even have one at home. It is by Knit Picks and it, it's a chart minder, a chart, um, something to hold your chart and keep track of. This is vinyl, so it wipes right off. It opens up like this, it's a magnet that just closes. And what's nice about it is now you can turn this around, attach it, now it will stand up. So if I am sitting on the couch, I can have this right next to me and look at it. Oh, you notice that these are four different magnet bars that come with it. So the way that I like to use it, we've got a good camera angle there. And later I'll 
share where I found this chart. It's in uh, common use. It is not under copyright anymore because it's over 100 years old. Um, they are not for sale, but you can distribute them or share them. So if I have this and I'm working on it, I'll grab a couple of these magnets. So I can use one magnet if I want to hold it. And let's say I'm working on this line right here. So I can isolate exactly what I want to work on. If I'm doing something very small, I can isolate it here. Or if I want to isolate a big area as I'm working, I can use that. This will hold it. So if it's sitting up on the couch like that and I'm looking at it, this can isolate exactly what I need it to as I move these around. One of the other things that I use at home, you may also, as, as I'm working on a chart and I finish something, I highlight it. So I know, yes, I have done that area. So I just keep a highlighter handy and I like that. One nice thing about this is you can see, flip it over, the paper is actually wider, but it still fits up. So it holds it just very nicely. I know some of you use your iPad for that, um, which is another handy idea, but a lot of times I have paper charts and I don't want to take the time to put it into my iPad. So I just use this. Now, if I'm using a chart, this was um, landscape. If I'm using something that's more portrait, see, it fits over both sides. I can hold both sides if I want. And as I use it, can again isolate this, but then if I need to go back over here, I can flip it around or just look at it that way. So this is a chart holder, something that you can use to keep your place. And let's say you're using a chart like that and you're done and you want to fold it so nobody bothers it, you can just fold it up. Or if you're traveling, and there it is, this nice lightweight little notebook magnetized on both sides. So I will put the link to this in the description. And one other thing I found is something called, and this was something I had at home. So the nitpicks, chart minder, that's something I had at home. This is something I had at home. It is called a buzz brush. Now, what it is used for is your computer, your phone, your iPad. Let me show you how to use it. So this end, and you might be wondering, why am I talking about something for the computer or my phone when we're talking about cross stitch? Well, this part will clean your phone very soft, it's level, so it'll clean it, won't scratch it, and then you can cover it right back up. But where it comes in for cross stitch is, look what's right here. It's a little brush. And when I saw that, I was cleaning my phone and pulled this out and I went, okay, this is supposed to be used for, and you can use it for, it's designed to fit in your keyboard. So you can get all the stuff out of your keyboard. But when I looked at that, I thought, you know, when you have to unpick something, and I did just last night, have to unpick something down in here because I had made a mistake. Let's use that to get rid of all the little threads. It didn't disturb the linen at all. And I could just use it get rid of all the threads, and then pop it back up. So I have two of these now. I keep one in with my sewing supplies, and I keep one 
by the computer. So that is called a buzz brush, and I will put the link to that also in the description. So I hope you enjoyed those fun finds. Here's the uh, chart holder originally for knitting, and I just set it. Here's the camera. I just set it next to me on the couch or on the table where I'm stitching, and I can just look at it and we go to the close-up camera. As I showed in the video, we can just throw those uh, magnet bars. They come with it wherever I need as I'm isolating my chart. So I love this. So that fun find, and then also, as you saw, the buzz brush. Love it. In fact, I'm going to get another one just to put next to my computer. And then I put one in my sewing basket where I sit and sew because this little brush, perfect. I used it when I had to pick out. And I know none of you ever had to take anything out, but I did when I was working on, where is Harriet Salt? When I was working on Harriet Salt, I had done a little bit and I hadn't decided what to do here. So I went down here and I don't know what I was thinking, but I just started working on the next letter, not realizing I needed more space between the rows than I left. So I had to pick out several of the letters there and just use this little brush. It was perfect. It did not leave any marks. It didn't disturb the linen. So that fun find, the buzz brush. And links will be in the description. And as I said before, if there's anything I've forgotten in the description, you're like, tell me about that, put it in the comments and I'll add it to the uh, description. So let me check my notes here. I think my notes right in front of me here. So I think I covered everything for this week. I plan on doing a video Every couple of weeks or so, I think I'm going to intersperse that with some product reviews that I found that are helpful. I know that's helped me when I've been trying to decide about a purchase. So I'll put those in or add those in between. So look, in a couple of weeks for Floss Tube 3. And what are we going to talk about? You'll have to wait and see. So it's been a pleasure to be with you again. I hope you've enjoyed our little time together today. If you have enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. If you'd like to have an alert when the next video is up, just hit that little bell and you'll get a notice when there's a new video. And if you would like to subscribe, you can then easily find my channel again. So uh, like, alert, subscribe, any of those. Thank you for doing that. And again, thank you for all the wonderful comments. I've, I've loved reading them. I read many of them out loud to my husband. I'm like, look, she did what I did. Look, she did this. He's like, yeah. <laughs> he's a guy. He, he's a computer guy, which he has helped me and he will be editing this video. So um, I appreciate him very much, but he doesn't know anything about stitching and doesn't really want to, although living with me all these years, he probably knows more than he realizes. So until our next time together, again, thank you. Happy stitching and be well. Mm -hmm.